So good morning uh, in Israel. It's morning right now. Uh, I'm really happy to be here uh, and talk about uh, EdTech and entrepreneurship soon and, and also have conversation with, with my colleagues. So maybe starting uh, before uh, starting the session, maybe Yoon and, and Jay, would you like to introduce yourselves? Let me let me go you, first. Yes, yeah. um, I, I'm Jay Choi, and I'm, I'm very happy to have a conversation with with, with you, Yun, and, and the Abi. And I'm I'm a CEO of SM Institute, which is the, the school for K-pop star, who wanna be K-pop star, and we are we are, we are going to recruit students, students from all over the world. And because the 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 edtech can do a lot of us. It's for music education or art education or physical education. So I'm interested in the edit tech solutions for that kind of field. And before I launched the, the, the SM Institute, I'm involved in a lot of many, many the project of ed tech companies. I launched my own one and I invested sometimes. So, and also I particularly interested in the global partnership so it's very, very nice to meet you, everybody. Great. And Yoon? Yes, my <laughs> name is Songye Yoon. I'm a CEO of Let's Lab. Let's Lab means leading educational technologies lab. Uh, I do research on education and I sometimes develop educational contents. And I'm interested in entrepreneurship education, especially for educators. So it's an honor to be a panelist in your session. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Amazing. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with giving sort of an overview about uh, the way we see uh, ethic entrepreneurship and, and, and some aspects of our activity, and then we can have it chat afterwards about it. Uh, so I'll share my screen. And um, on this slide, you can see uh, the backyard of mindset. We are based in Israel. <clears throat> we are an edtech accelerator and, um, and our headquarters is based in the Negev desert in the south of Israel. We have also a branch in Tel Aviv, which is the, the, the heart of the ecosystem in Israel and a branch in the north of Israel. Uh, but I think the fact that we are based like uh, in the desert uh, means a lot because we try really to uh, initiate uh, innovation uh, in periphery. And, that, and I'm going to elaborate on this uh, later on. And, and Mindset was established uh, as a spin-off of CET. This is why we spell Mindset with a C. CET is the Center for Educational Technology, the major player in the Israeli uh, education a system uh, that, that deals with the uh, educational technology and, and the big publisher. And uh, the reasoning for why Mindset was established can, can be explained very easily uh, by this uh, slide that we see. Uh, like this, this uh, cartoon describes a father that sit, sits with his son and tells him, you know, the world was exactly the same uh, when I was in your age. And, and uh, I guess there was never any conversation like this with, between a father and a son, but uh, this, this uh, cartoon is much more funny today because we really feel the gaps between the, the, the generation. When I'm saying generations, it's not even between uh, parents and kids. It's also between kids themselves, like a kid, let's say uh, 10 years old and a kid 15 years old are totally different uh, generations in many senses uh, because of the, the internet culture around us. And, um, and this gap of generations is actually a gap about the way uh, we see learning in general. Um, and, and in the last two decades, uh, most of the, let's say, important elements or building blocks of learning have changed dramatically. It could be expressions or uh, um, ways of memorizing or uh, the notion of community or the notion of communication, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And all those, all those aspects are actually the aspects that really generates learning. And, uh, 
as individual, no matter whether we are students or parents or teachers, we are learning already for a long time uh, in the internet culture uh, under the same new uh, paradigm of what is mean to, to learn in this age. But when, when we are entering the schools and the institutions, we are still very much alike uh, in the same structure that used to be the environment that our parents were learning, even our grandparents maybe. And, uh, and this gap is, is really a threat on education. It's a threat on education because uh, we learn much less effectively and we, even the, the, the question of what we learn is, is, uh, is not uh, sharp enough and, and connected enough to the reality outside schools. And then um, mindset uh, goal in a way is, is to try to close this gap using new uh, technologies and, uh, and leaning on startups. And uh, before explaining about the role of startups and the way we see it, I think we should say a few words about educational technology because uh, as opposed to startups and entrepreneurship, which is a new movement in education, educational technology is here for a long time. I think more than six decades now. But uh, there is something on the way that educational technology was designed uh, in many cases, which did not really uh, took it to the place uh, it could it could be and to the role that it could uh, fulfill. Uh, this postcard that we see on the screen uh, was uh, designed by a French illustrator <clears throat> in the end of the 19th century. It was part of an exhibition that tries to envision the way the world would look like in the year of 2000. And as we can see, the, the illustrator really imagined the educational technology. Uh, but he could not avoid uh, the structure of, of the classroom. Like right? there is a teacher, there are books, uh, the kids are sitting in a rows, uh, so they are listening to the books, and and there is a poor boy that uh, chops the books in the machine in the corner. But in the end of the day, it's the same school and it's the same structure, and and uh, many of the uh, technological solutions that were designed for educational world. Um, were suffering from the same problem, like this being an amplifier of the existing world and not really suggesting an alternative. And in this sense, uh, startups really, really have the potential to suggest something new. To suggest something that is not similar to the existing world. Uh, but before explaining why, I think we should uh, say a few words about this notion of startups, because uh, I think we should have it clear what what is the difference between a startup and a company or a business. Uh, and speaking about startups, especially in Israel, I can say sometimes is involved with a lot of cliches. Like when we're saying startup, we are thinking about those uh, young kids that are eating pizza and beer in the middle of the night and have one brilliant idea and, and have an exit a few minutes afterwards. But, but actually, um, I think when we are speaking about startup, we should have in front of our eyes the definition of Steve Blank, uh, which is one of the, let's say, more uh, uh, sound people uh, that are, are really writing about the, this world of, of startups. And Steve Blank uh, presents startups as a temporary organization. Uh, and this is very important. Uh, because startups are temporary organizations, they are really dedicated to the tasks they're trying to solve not to the organization. When you have a, a more established company, you already work not just on, on your tasks and missions, you work also on keeping the, the organization working properly, and then uh, you're missing a lot of energy. So startups are really dedicated for one specific thing and are free from the more organizational aspects. And, and this one specific thing is, is a is a research uh, project, actually. They're really searching for a, a repeatable and scalable business model. And this search is really a research. They really, really try to, to understand something about the world. It's not that they have an idea and they bring it to the world. They really do this research. And this research has, in a way, the vision, uh, sometimes the megaloman vision of, of uh, being big. And, and this, this thing of being big is important because startups in the end of the day want to change the world 
and and uh, if we want to to uh, like uh, present what is the journey that startups does it's very uh, remote from this uh, idea of one idea uh, one bright idea it's it's actually a very long process of uh, uh, research and prototyping and testing and designing and again and again and uh, like from the mental perspective uh, it's it's something that starts from confusions uh, go all over the world to understanding and clarity and in the end of the day to the focus and the design is an outcome of a focus that uh, and this is the project of the startup and um, and when we are comparing startups to let's say uh, traditional organizations i think the the core uh, difference about uh, the way they work is about planning uh, and and this slide that we see is is a slide that uh, at a picture that we take uh, we took a few years ago with one of our startups code monkey that became to be a very successful startup all over the world uh, they are uh, working on teaching kids to code through gaming and uh, and you can see the the first sketches in the on the picture on the left that they really sketched it on this specific time and then the screen that came out of it and and the way planning works in startups is totally different from the way we know it from other uh, traditional ways of working like like let's take uh, henry ford henry ford when he uh, decided to uh, design his new car uh, he took a bunch of engineers he put them in a in a lab and they were working on a prototype uh, they're not they has as uh, the, the famous quote was that we we know about uh, ford says that uh, he did not ask the users because if he would have asked them they would say that they want uh, faster horses. Uh, he he thought he knew what is the best, and actually he knew. Like he created a product that was uh, successful for almost twenty years. The same product, based on the uh, great work of the engineers, and and the process of the engineers of Ford and the process of engineers in in uh, any other uh, established uh, organization of development is based on the, this model that calls the waterfall model, starting from uh, analysis and design, going through the coding, testing, and, and, uh, and maintenance. And the thing about the waterfall model, which of course is very logical one, that uh, is similar to the waterfall, you cannot really go back. Like uh, the, the water are pouring to one direction. You cannot uh, <clears throat> go from maintenance again to, to design or again to, to code. Uh, like the expectation from you is that you will do the perfect project and then uh, it will go only to one, one direction. And uh, as opposed to this model, I think the, the very most common models in the world of startups are based on, on different kinds of canvases. And I think what the good thing like this one, like the, the Lean Canvas and there are many others as well. And, and the good thing about those canvas are that they are First of all, they are all on the same page. You see all the time, your whole business model is actually on one paper. It's shallow, it's quick, but it enables you to see the big picture all the time. And it's dynamic. You, you are using this as like a map that you all the time go back and forth and, and, and change your, uh, your perspective according for what you're learning from the users. And, and uh, this differences is actually a huge and deep difference between organizations like NASA that the NASA uh, uh, motto is uh, failure is not an option. And of course, we are very happy that NASA motto is failure is not an option because we would, wouldn't like a spaceship to go to the space and discover that something doesn't work. It doesn't work in, in when you are designing a spaceship, you, you don't want to, to have any mistakes. But, but the ethos of startups is totally different. It's, it's much more similar to this uh, Samuel Beckett uh, uh, famous quote of, of uh, uh fail <clears throat> try again fail again and fail better and we we are failing all the time in the world of startup but we are failing better we're learning from from one experience to the other and and this is really a totally different perspective i think this perspective also connected to to the question of autonomy startups uh, as opposed to this uh, famous uh, movie of charlie chaplin are not working on a very uh, small piece of the project. 
they are seeing the whole picture uh, and they know as opposed to this movie that you have no idea what they are actually producing they know exactly what they want to achieve what is the problem they want to solve they have the problem all the time in front of their eyes and this is extremely important and last startup have this the the ability to really act in uncertainty and in uh, reality that changes and uh, and and really understand very quickly where the world is going to and suggest uh, new new solutions different solutions from the one they suggested before and and this is why they are the best uh, i think the best vehicle for uh, looking again into education and suggesting new solutions we are in the mode of transition we are in this era in which uh, uh, the notion of learning is, is changing very deeply and we need those people who really can understand what it means uh, to act under a, a world that is changing. And, uh, and in the world of startup, we know, of course, the notion of accelerator and, and mindset is an accelerator, basically. And, and when we're speaking about accelerators in education, um, we, they are pretty much a diverse uh, group of, of uh, ed tech accelerators across the globe. Um, mindset was the second in the world that uh, really started this notion of ethic accelerators uh, about nine years ago. The first one was uh, um, Imagine Kate Wealth, which today is part of uh, Y Combinator. And I can say that uh, most of the accelerators we met when we started uh, are not existing anymore. Like, uh, I think the only one that still exists is uh, Learn Launch, and all the rest really. Uh, uh became later and the reason for this this accelerator is not a very good business it's a great framework to to help startups uh but if you want to create an accelerator you need to have uh, another additional reason uh, just an accelerator standalone never works uh, so some of the accelerators are, are like uh, scouting uh, unit for uh, uh, vcs for uh, for ventures some of the accelerators are serving uh, big companies in a way mindset is, is this type and some of them are serving a mission and, and uh, let's say a non-profit uh, ideology that wants really to to encourage the market and then um, mindset uh, i think what's unique about the way mindset works is is the difference uh, attitude to who are the entrepreneurs we have beside of the typical business entrepreneurs also educators entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs and residents and in a, in a second i will elaborate on this and um, the, the the key perspective in mindset is is that uh, we try to create the encounter between startups and education we don't think startup as a standalone can do any difference and 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 we think the dialogue between the startups and the world of education is the secret sauce and uh, it's a dialogue between totally different cultures like one culture is about tradition and processes and uh, and uh, like uh, bringing the the past and explaining the, the students what they have to learn and and the other one is about shortcuts and about uh, having doubts and about uh, suggesting alternatives so so putting them in the same room can really create something uh, very fruitful and and trying to really uh, summarize what an accelerator does i think first the most important thing that the accelerator should do and and this is what we try to do is really creating uh, access for the startups uh, both to the community but also to uh, business support and pedagogy and and uh, technology and and uh, users and beta sites which is extremely important um and if narrowing, uh, uh, like uh, looking a bit deeper uh, in the end of the day, and I think the case in mindset is very similar to other startups, other accelerators, uh, an accelerator really brought to bring together different kinds of startups that have something in common. So in the mindset case, we bring together startups that what they have in common is their interest in learning. But uh, we can see in the same batch, for instance, a company like uh, Plethora, which uh, created a, a game for kids that teaches uh, computational thinking, and a company like Connecting, which is a company that uh, really um, creates sorts of uh, um, platform for online courses based on mobile, 
um, uh, for a small and medium businesses for learning, or a company uh, like Big Talk, which teaches English through uh, uh, voice assistance. So there are very different markets, very different uh, ages, but what they have in common is, is, the, is the fact that they are dealing with learning, which in the end of the day is, is, uh, is a very important uh, aspect. And uh, during the years of mindset, we, we, we I think, reached uh, a very uh, nice number of uh, students that were affected and, and, and teacher, etc. Uh, but I'm, I'm putting this slide because uh, I, I want to, to remind ourselves that in the end of the day, we have to measure uh, accelerators and, and really understand whether this is effective. So the easy measurements are the one that we see now on the slide. Like I can say roughly how many students we met and how many teachers we, we, we faced and so forth. Uh, but the difficult ones is very difficult to, to measure, and they are the most important one. Like, we really try to bring alternative to the world of education and to suggest something new. And, uh, and this is something which is very difficult to measure. And another thing that is difficult to measure is the learning efficiency and uh, whether we are creating in the end of the day better learning. So these are like the main question we are dealing with. And if I have to summarize what what is happening in a, in in an accelerator and i think the, the case in mindset is similar to other accelerators i think we can follow the this uh, famous uh, quote of eric Ries, another uh, name that is really very dominant in the world of the lean startup movement and eric Ries says that startup has to have those three elements of uh, think big start small and scale fast and and in mindset we try to to follow those lines in our programs um, and I'll start from, uh, from the um, starting small. And, uh, and the starting small from our perspective is really meeting users from a very early stage. We are really meeting user from day one, again, the, one of the first slides of Code Monkey. Um, and we work according to this uh, famous uh, illustration of, of the Lean Startup, building a minimum valuable product, testing it, measuring, and, and then learning and, and going back to, to designing. And this is not a trivial process. Again, comparing startups to established companies, established company would never go outside to the users with a shaky product that uh, is not perfect. Uh, and startup does this all the time. And this is why we need startups. It's, it's like a really open to discussion with the users. And in mindset, we have a sort of community of early adopters that uh, are testing our products uh, from day one, both teachers and, uh, and schools. And, and, uh, and this is a very important uh, part of, of our process. Uh, going to the scale fast and, and, uh, and thinking about scale fast. So one of the, the main takeaways that we have about scaling for startups is that uh, if you really want to help startups, you should have different programs and different attitude for different stages. Like the needs of a startup in the very initial stage and the needs of a startup who already have sales is totally different. But they're both needing the kind of support that Accelerator can give. And in Mindset today, we have four uh, different uh, frameworks, uh, programs to work with, with the new initiatives. Uh, the very basic one is starting from the needs. We work with schools they present the needs and we design together with them solutions. And this is really a very fascinating uh, process that afterwards helps us with, with the more advanced stages. The next one is, is a program called Ignite in which we are bringing together teachers, teacher entrepreneurs and uh, developers. And they are creating products that starts from the idea stage uh, to minimum valuable product. And then we have uh, uh, two more accelerator programs for more established uh, uh, stages, like the accelerator that is, does, does the product market fit and, and mindset goals that takes companies from one region to expand globally. Uh, in the last two programs, we also work with the companies across the globe, not just Israelis, like half of the companies are Israelis and half from other countries. And, and another important part of, of scaling is investment. And at least in Israel, uh, and in Europe, 
there is not enough capital to invest in, in the good companies. And uh, let's say out of 10 companies in a cohort, we have two or three that really promising. They are putting too much energy uh, in uh, raising money instead of working on their own products. And we're trying to find ways to invest in them so they can really run and, and do whatever they have to do uh, in their projects. We initiated a few years a micro fund uh, that uh, invested in Israelis and, and uh, European companies. And now we are raising a bigger one um, uh, exactly to create this, uh, this uh, vehicle for the, those who are really successful and, and have to, to scale. And last, uh, thinking big. And uh, to explain the way we see thinking big, we can go back to the year of 2007. Uh, in the year of 2007, uh, it happened four things that really changed the human being definition in a way. Uh, smartphones, social networks, cloud computing, and open source movement. And of course, none of those things started in the year of 2007. All of them started beforehand, but this year was the break year. Like this year, all of those movements started to be real. And I'm mentioning this because while I was uh, already an adult in, in the year of 2007, I, di I, ne I didn't feel it. I didn't feel that I'm now in a very historical moment that uh, really changes uh, what it means to be a human being, that, that right now as we speak, something dramatically is happening and I have to really, if I'm developing a new solution, understand this, this dramatic transition. And, and, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult really to, to be uh, in a moment of transition and really understanding that this is the case. And, uh, and now I, I'm, we try to ask ourselves, what is the, the 2007 of now? What, what is the big thing that happens right now that can really change education deeply? And, and I think it's, it's about AI. It's about uh, artificial, artificial intelligence. Of course, uh, we speak about uh, artificial intelligence for many years. Also, I think uh, more than five decades, but uh, more than even seven decades, actually. But uh, I think the last two, three years, uh, it's a totally ball game, different ball game. And the potential for education is huge. Usually when we speak about the potential of education in, in AI, we are speaking about personalized learning, which is, of course, a very big promise. But I think there are some many other areas that can be affected by the AI. Uh, and I would like to give briefly three examples just to get the flavor. Uh, a company that I hope is uh, going to be presenting in the conference, Ment, Ment.io, a company, Israeli company, that designed a, a forum of uh, discussions, very similar for the forums we knew in the 90s. But this forum is... is, is uh, run by an AI engine. And this AI engine, which is, by the way, a language agnostic, it can be in Hebrew or in Korean or in English, um, he can say, what is the quality of the discussion? As you can see, each of the speakers have a grade and, uh, and, the, and, and the system can really rank each one of the speakers according to the way he acts. And the performance uh, are based on, for instance, how much I'm arguing with some other person or how much uh, I'm bringing uh, reasoning for what I'm saying. And, uh, and whether I'm speaking only with the lecture or maybe with, the, let's say, five or six more kids in my classroom. And all those aspects are actually bringing the opportunity to evaluate uh, things that we could not evaluate uh, in the old world because we, we could not really... Uh, first of all, measure uh, what it means to have a good discussion, but we could, I mean, based on this, we could never also direct kids in, in, in the right way to do it. And here we have huge opportunity thanks to the AI engine. Uh, another uh, example, uh, also an Israeli company, not for educational world, we are now discussing with them, bringing their uh, technology to the world of education, an AI engine that uh, helps you to improve your text uh, or to rewrite your text. And uh, it works like magic. Uh, you can, all of you can, uh, if you want, download this and, and try it on your uh, Chrome browser. You put a paragraph and you say, I want to, to make this paragraph sound like uh, academic 
statement, and then he creates an, an, an academic statement. I want it to be business uh, oriented, and then it created it like a business oriented. And, and as a learner, I, I, I'm learning through this, using this device also, what it means to have an academic uh, uh, text. What it, what's the difference between an academic text and, and a business text or a casual way of writing. So it's really a, a huge uh, breakthrough in, in, in the world of text and, and expression. And the last example, something that we are dealing with in mindset for a few years now, is the uh, voice assistance in the world of schools. And again, uh, AI has improved so much that uh, today you can really have a very uh, intimate kind of talk with, with the voice assistants, especially in English. And uh, we discovered that this is extremely effective for kids who are learning English as a second language. Like one of the, we know that the, if you want to acquire an, another language, you have to speak a lot. There is no other magic to do it. Uh, but students, actually everyone, I think, is, is always ashamed to be heard speaking uh, the other language and hearing his mistakes. And uh, when they are speaking with, with the machine, th there is no one human being that is judging them. They're really speaking with the machine. So it really, really uh, uh, bring their uh, practice to be, to be much better. So this is like, a, in a nutshell, a few examples of, of, of the, some of the potentials we already see about AI in education. And this is like the, the new uh, think big of our uh, age. I would like to end uh, in uh, reminding this book of Neil Postman. Neil Postman was a really extremely interesting uh, thinker about uh, the world of technology. And his last book uh, called The End of Education which he calls in this book to create new narratives, new narrative, new stories about why are we going to school? What, what is the, the, the purpose of, of really uh, of education? And, and uh, I feel that we really need this kind of a new story that brings together the, the new technologies and, and the new culture that is driven from new technologies uh, and, and, and put them as part of the story. And I think startups, have this uh, ability to be part of, of uh, creating this new story. So I'll stop here. By the way, this is uh, our headquarters in the desert Negev, and you're all invited when it's going to be possible to travel okay. across the globe. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Abby. It's, it's very, very, very much impressive because the, especially in Korea, there's no, we, we have accelerators, but the we have no other tech accelerators, and which I think very sad for Korean Korean tech startups. And and then you give many the the good ideas for for Korean the people. And and thank you very much for sharing your ideas and what you have done so far. I have questions for you, and I think the Israel company, also a Korean company. The education market in Israel and Korea is not that big. So to scale fast and fast, we, we have to think about the, the, the world market like US or China or especially India. Do you have any the advice to, to companies in, in Israel and Korea or in the, the, the companies we choose would you like to enter the, the, the India or US market or China market? Do we have any advice for the kind of editor company? Yes, actually, first of all, I must say that the, the Korean market is much bigger than the Israeli one. Yeah. Israel, <laughs> Israel is really, really small, uh, but, but I agree. Uh, and I also believe that startups should go global even even if they are living in a big markets, I think going global make, brings a lot of value for education. I believe uh, like uh, looking at uh, for a larger picture, I believe the, the most important thing is thinking global from day one. Like one of the difficulties I see with Israeli startups that are starting just from the Israeli market and then thinking about going global that uh, sometime uh, changing the product according to the needs of other countries is very difficult. And I think when you have in your mind uh, the other markets that you are looking at, it's more easier for you to, to see the generalities. So this is one advice. And the other one, 
is, is applying to the Global Ethics Startup Awards, <clears throat> which Mindset is, is leading. And, and um, the Global Startup Ethics Awards is a, is a competition for startups, but it's also a huge community. So even if you are not winning anything in, in the competition, you are becoming to be part of the community that uh, there are members from 100 countries across the globe there. So it's, it's, a, it's a very good way to start uh, creating connection with the, the market you will, you're uh, aiming to, uh, because in the end of the day, you need someone local to really take you through the market that you are, let's say it's the Indian market or, or uh, the American market, someone that will really, uh, a local person that can take you there. And, and so I think it's it worth investing in creating those connections. Thank you. Thank you. And one more question is the, what do you consider the, as the most important factor when you choose an edtech company? Well, it's a, it's a great question. I can say that first of all, there is some aspect that, which is uh, the case for any company, any startup in any industry. Uh, it's almost a cliche, but it's a, a right cliche, uh, the team. Uh, in mm -hmm. the end of the day, this is the most important part. Uh, we always try to see that the team are the right people, that they understand what they're speaking about, that they have the energy and, and the ability to lead and, and, the, and also the ability to listen. Sometimes entrepreneurs are very stubborn uh, in a way that they don't really open to understand uh, what reality says. And, and this journey that I described beforehand is about failing and, and, uh, and getting feedback and changing. So you have to be very, very good listener. So this is like in the team part. In the product side, we try always to, to choose startups that have the potential to suggest an alternative, not just to amplify the old world. For instance, we have in the old world, we had uh, books and now we have uh, e-books. E so we had the blackboards and now we have interactive boards. This is not the kind of uh, solutions that we are looking at because they are amplifiers. We really look for some solutions that can modify education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your sharing your idea. And then you, do you have any further questions? Yes, please allow me to ask you a few questions. Sure. Uh, Mr. Che asked questions from the business side. And let me ask you some questions from different point of view. My first question is, uh, as a pioneer to bring entrepreneur principles into education, so I think there must have been difficulties. So what was the most difficult and how did you get through it? Well, it's a great question. Um... I think maybe the most difficult part was uh, to to start uh, like um, with the empty restaurant. You know that uh, you're starting something, uh, you're opening a, an accelerator for startups, but there are no startups. Uh, and and our first cohort was a, a bunch of companies that uh, had only PowerPoint. It was really and 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 most of the ideas were very premature and. Uh, so it, it took time to create the ecosystem. And uh, in a way, the, the first steps are really, uh, uh, you're not sure you're doing something that will uh, ever uh, last and, uh, or it's gonna be like an anecdote of, of a failure. So I think maybe this was the, the most uh, challenging one. Yeah, I can imagine that. <laughs> Thank you. And my second question is, uh, what do you think is the most effective way to bring together startups, educators, researchers, and others? Uh, who should lead such effort? Uh, maybe private organization or government or something? Well, I, I think I think the social uh, soft kind of events are a very good way to start. Uh, for instance, we we are doing a lots of hackathons, and uh, hackathon is a great opportunity because, uh, from the one hand, you have a, a goal, you are developing something, uh, everyone is in the same space in the same time, 
and then then the magic happens. Uh, and and uh, I can say that during the years, based on some of the hackathons afterwards, uh, partnership were created and entrepreneurs that uh, were in a different industry decided to move to education and, and so forth. So I think this kind of events have very really lots of potential. A very good point. Thank you. Uh, actually, in Korea, I think it is not easy for teachers to take on challenges other than teaching because teachers are public servant. So they are usually expected to focus on work in school. So my question is, have you ever seen any hurdle for teachers to be entrepreneur? What environment will help teachers develop their entrepreneurship? Well, first of all, I can say that it, it's also something uh, cultural, like in Israel, teachers as well are part of the, let's say, working for the government and it, the, the, most of the education is public, but still they have this uh, flexibility, some of them have this flexibility. I can say that in the end of the day, uh, not every teacher can be an entrepreneur. Uh, uh, and, and we try to work with those who really have this ability to do it and, and, uh, and this uh, uh, instincts and, and motivation. Uh, we never convinced any teacher to be an entrepreneur. Uh, the opposite. We, we usually publish a call for application and, and we have to choose like 10 or 12 teachers out of 200 or, or, or 300 teachers. So it's really something they are competing on. And uh, there is a lot of glory in being chosen in this and we try also when we are designing those program to 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 bring this glory like uh, make it something that they can be proud of in front of their uh, schools and their uh, co-workers and, and and their families and so forth and uh, so so I, I guess there is a lot of work to do, to do with across those lines but beside of those lines i can say that uh, one of our breakthrough in this aspect was that the government had acknowledged this our program of entrepreneurship as a professional development for teachers like teachers who are going through our process are already recognized by the government like they did a very long professional development so uh, it, it it speaks the same uh, bureaucratical language that the, the educational system speaks and it's very helpful Thank you. Uh, I think this will be the last question. Uh, what role do you think educators, including teachers, can play in the edtech ecosystem? Can you give some advice for educators? Well, it's a great question. I think uh, our habit is, is to see teachers, as you said before, like uh, public servants that they have to to fulfill some kind of a task. And uh, we don't see them as an active players that can really affect and change uh, the system. And uh, I think they can be, first of all, uh, contributing to this, like uh, in our program, teachers, one of our programs, teachers are, are leading the, the development and, and uh, in the teams that we have uh, two teachers and a uh, programmer and designer, Usually the teachers are the, are the most dominant ones and, and, uh, and, and we see that they really bring the, the voice of the needs. They really understand in the best way what, what is uh, required, what are the gaps, what are the challenges. Uh, so they, they have a very good position to, to really uh, lead this kind of a change. Uh, looking at on the most uh, successful uh, ethics startup right now in the US, like uh, New Zella or uh, um, Clever or, or other startups, you can see that the founders, usually one of them or even two of them are teachers, uh, ex-teachers, because they really uh, bring the, the, the most accurate picture about the field. So I think they can play a major role. Thank you very much. I can relate. To that. Yes, and I, I think I have to say thank you again because you you, you give us many insights and and, and and the probably the people who watch this video will also feel many many things and they they, they will also want to say thank you for you. I, 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 
the, the, the hope to see you soon in Korea, maybe, or in Israel, to discuss further about education business. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to meet you both and uh, really happy to, to find ways to meet uh, face to face. Yeah. Thank you very much.